And about three weeks ago, maybe four weeks ago, I was having a conversation with Zach Lorton. And Zach is on a praise and worship team. He's an employee here at the church. I was having this conversation with him. He began to share with me a testimony. And I said, Zach, I want you to share that with the congregation. That is a log that needs to go on the fire. And so Zach is going to share that today. And I want you to receive from him. It's going to be a blessing. You'll be able to relate to the word that's coming today. Are you ready to receive? Give Zach a big hand clap. Zach Lorton, thank you, brother. Amen. Hey, Pastor. All right. Hello. How y'all doing? I can't hear you. I said, how y'all doing? All right. So uh, Pastor Darren, what he said is, uh, I, 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 I'm going to back up a little bit. I was on an adrenaline hike as I taught in Alton this morning, and then I had to get here as quickly as I could. I am on staff here at Enjoy Church. I work in media production. A lot of the stuff that you see, the graphics and the video, it's most of my responsibility to help make some of that happen as far as what it looks like. <laughs> Getting it to you is another story. So, But I also am one of the worship leaders here at Enjoy Church. And... Um, it, so it's really odd for me to be on this platform in this context. And before I do anything else, I want to thank Pastors Darren and Laura for giving me the opportunity to do this. Um, he told me one time years ago that he, he had a t-shirt that said, singers sing and preachers preach. And neither between the two shall they cross. And that's not always the case. The reason he asked me to share this with you guys today is because I think this is going to relate to every single one of you. And I want to just park here for a moment and say, Pastors Darren and Laura have done a phenomenal job of curating a team of teachers here at Enjoy Church. From time to time, you're going to see somebody other than Pastor Darren up on that platform. Pastor Laura's going to teach. Keisha's going to teach. Pastor Ryan's going to teach. Tammy Taylor Hewitt is going to teach. And I want to encourage you, if for some reason you might ever catch wind that somebody other than Pastor Darren is teaching, come to church anyway, okay? Here's why. The Bible says, the Bible says very clearly that faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word of God. It doesn't say hearing comes by the person you like hearing the most. The word is the word is the word is the word. And whoever's on this platform teaching it, you need to be open to receiving that. Okay. So we'll see how today goes. I might be out of that team. I might not. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see what happens. I want to share this with you guys because this is something that's, uh, a little personal to me, and until I shared this with Pastor Darren, I hadn't really shared this with anybody. It's May 23rd, 2019, and I'm at home, and I'm looking at a piece of paperwork filled out by one of my clients. In addition to working here at the church, I also work a second job. Many of you know, if you follow me on social media, as a DJ. I work in the wedding industry, and I've been working with the company... All right, <laughs> sure. <laughs> I've been working with the company I'm with for about 15 years, and I've done almost 900 events in that time, 90% of which are weddings ceremonies, receptions, and things like that. So I spend about an hour on the phone with every client that I work with. But before I do that, I look over the paperwork to see if there's anything out of the ordinary I need to be aware of. And as I'm looking over this, there's this name that sticks out at me from the paper. It's a guy by the name of Kevin. Not his real name, by the way. I'll explain why later. <laughs> Kevin is a guy that I knew from when I was in junior high school. Kevin bullied people in junior high. More to the point, Kevin bullied me in junior high. He was not a good kid. I'm not saying he made fun of me, and I'm not saying he teased me, although he did do those things. I'm saying he physically threatened me. He physically intimidated me. He would, like, block my path in the hallways. His MO was, if you even accidentally bumped him, you want to go? You want to fight? You want to go? That was where he lived 24 hours a day. I mean, that's, that's kind of who he was. And there was this fire in his eyes that was just like, it's almost like he relished it. And he made my life a living hell. Um, people ask, well, why didn't you just beat him down? Well, I would have, except for the fact that he was bigger and stronger than me. See, we got, we got in a fist fight once. We got in a fight once. It was a very short-lived fight. It didn't end well for me, just going to be honest with you. But it happened in front of a bunch of people. Even though there was no bloody noses or broken bones, I was humiliated in front of a lot of people. And Kevin also had a mouth. So he told all of his friends, who, by the way, were also bullies, he had a network. And they kind of followed suit. And it just, it just never went away. And every single day. And some people have also asked me, well, why didn't you just get away from him? Because he rode the same bus I rode to school. I couldn't get away from him. I saw him in the morning. I saw him midday in gym class. 
score. And then I saw him in the afternoon on the way home. The guy knew where I lived. And he would use that to taunt me all the time. And this happened over and over and over, over a two-year period. And one day, I, I, just, I just snapped. And something happened in my subconscious. I had a dream one night where I killed Kevin. Why is a worship leader talking about killing people? <laughs> Understand something. I'm not a violent person. I'm passionate. I'm opinionated. I'm outspoken. And many times, I'm direct. And I'm not mean. I'm not violent. Although sometimes that combination of four things can make people think that I'm being mean. And that's not the case. I don't have a mean bone in my body. I really don't. And I'm not violent either. It takes a lot to get me to the point where I think about pounding someone down. And I have thought about it. But I had a dream where I went the next level and I killed this kid. I'm standing over his body. He's bleeding out. I'm holding whatever weapon I used. I, I don't remember anything of the dream up to that moment because that moment has burned in my memory. I had this feeling of euphoric relief wash over my body. I could physically feel it in my dream because I knew I would never again have to put up with any of his crap. Anybody? Anybody? Okay, I want you to understand something. If you've got a child in your life that's being bullied, somebody in your family, a niece, nephew, grandson, granddaughter, if they're being bullied like this, this is what goes on in the head of someone who has to deal with this every single day. They're not okay. I want you to understand that. This affected my ability to connect with people on a level that I'm still dealing with to this day. And it's May 23rd, 2013, and I'm looking at a piece of paper with his name on it. And not only is he involved in making the ceremony happen, he is officiating the ceremony. Now, for those of you not up on wedding lingo, that means he's the guy that's marrying the bride and groom. And so my logic kicks in. If anything, I learned from Spock and the Apostle Paul, it's logic. <laughs> It's been 25 years at this point since we graduated high school. He's got to be a different guy. He's got to be a different guy. I'm a different guy. I'm the same guy, but I'm a different guy, so he had to have changed, and no one's going to ask somebody who's terrorizing them or other people to officiate their wedding, so he's, he's got to be different. And I, I wonder, I'm always looking for that connection with a client when I'm talking with them on the phone, you know, something that we have in common. <laughs> so I'm wondering whether I should bring up the fact that I know this guy. <laughs> We get on the phone and we're talking about stuff. I'm talking with the bride and the groom. And I say, hey, at some point I need to get together with the officiant to, you know, do a sound check and everything. By the way, I noticed that your officiant's name is Kevin. They're like, yeah, he's an awesome guy. He's our best friend in the world. We've known him for several years. He's a great guy. We love him to death. In fact, we asked him to get ordained specifically so that he could do our wedding. I said, oh, okay, all right. Um... I'm just going to take a chance here. Any chance he graduated from Melville High School? They're like, yeah. I'm like, did he get married to a woman named, and I named his wife's name? They're like, yeah. I said, yeah, I know him. Really? Yeah, we went, to, uh, we went to school together. We met when we were in junior high. In fact, me and him and his wife, all three of us graduated high school the same year. They're like, oh, that's so cool. And the bride says, was he nice to you? <laughs> what she said was, was he nice to you? What I heard was, <laughs> because now I have exactly one second to respond to this question. Because if I hesitate any longer than that, they're going to know. She asked the question for a reason. And what I don't want to do is I don't want to dump my personal crap into, you know, a consultation that I'm having with a client. My job as a DJ is to help them realize their perfect vision of a wedding ceremony and a wedding reception. They don't want me... Hmm throwing my stuff in there. But I don't want to lie. So I said, yeah. you know, we weren't friends. We weren't friends. We didn't hang out with the same group of people. You know, he rode the same bus as me. We had gym class together. We didn't really interact with each other after junior high school. We, we had two completely different set of friends. We weren't friends. I probably said we weren't friends like nine times or something like that. <laughs> and they're like, oh, okay. We get through the rest of the conversation and everything gets it's much safer then. 
<laughs> it's May 31st, 2019. I'm at Tappawingo Golf Course in St. Louis, Missouri, and I'm setting up for this wedding ceremony and reception. Groom comes walking into the room. Kevin's his best friend. Kevin's in tow. He sees me across the room, and the groom says, are you Zach? I said, yeah. I walk over, I meet him, shake his hand, and I hear this voice. Is that Zach Lorton? Hey, Kevin, how you doing? He comes over. I extend my right hand to shake his. He offers me his left hand. I'm not expecting this, so I break eye contact to look down to grab his, his left hand. And when I do, I notice his right hand is completely shrunken and withered. Something's happened to Kevin. I don't know what. At some point during that day, I said, hey, we got to get together. i got to get you with a microphone, do a sound check, go over the details of the, of the ceremony. And we do that. He sounds fine. He's looking over the notes with me. And he says, man, I'm really nervous about this. I said, really, why? He goes, well, I'm not used to reading in front of other people. Kevin was in some remedial classes when we were in junior high, and he knew that I knew that, and he didn't like the fact that I knew that because it was ammunition I could have used against him if I really wanted to. I never did. But I understood reading was not his strongest suit. And I'm looking at his notes, and I said, did you write this? Because a lot of people, when they get ordained one, for a one-shot wedding, they just copy and paste something off of the Internet. He's like, no, I, I wrote this. They asked me to, to, to say something real you know, genuine and from the heart. I said, man, I don't think you have a thing to worry about. I said, those two people, they love you. They care about you. They were the ones who asked you to officiate this wedding. You're going to be fine. I said, if, if you stumble over your words or something like that, just, just you know, walk through it. It's not the biggest deal in the world. They're not going to care. They're not even going to notice. They're going to be staring at each other's eyes. You're going to be absolutely fine. I'm encouraging the guy that terrorized me when I was a kid. Some kind of switch going on here. And I'm like, and to me, I was just doing my professional job. I was just being the DJ that I know how to be. We get through the ceremony. Everything goes great. He makes zero mistakes. I make one. We finish up with that. We, get to, we go into the, the cocktail hour. Everybody's loosening up a little bit. And I'm getting ready to introduce the bride and the groom into the reception hall. And the groom talks to me. And he's like, so, you know, when we were on the phone with you last week, I noticed, you know, there was a little bit of hesitation in your voice when she asked if, you know, if you knew Kevin. I'm like, oh, you noticed that, did you? Because, well, all I noticed was the ticking of the time bomb that she put in my lap. It was one second long. <laughs> and he says, I didn't say that. I said, oh. And he said, well, yeah, and we know Kevin has a past. We met him long after that. But we know he's a different person, completely different person than he used to be. So after I got off the phone with you, I called Kevin. I said, oh. Sorry. He tells Kevin, hey, we just got off the phone with our DJ. We're really excited about the day. By the way, he says he knows you. Oh, really? What's his name? Zach Lorton. Kevin freaks out. Oh, God. Oh, no. Oh, no. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. Kevin, what are you talking about? That's 25, 30 years ago. You're not the same guy. No, I can't do it. You don't understand. I was horrible to this kid. I never expected for a moment that Kevin might think about that. You see, about a year after we graduated high school, Kevin was in a pretty severe motorcycle accident. I don't know the extent or the details of what happened, but it left him paralyzed in his right arm. That's why his hand was withered up and shrunken. He hadn't used it in almost 25 years. And when he was recovering from that accident, he thought back on everything that he had done, all the ways that he had treated people in his life from when he was really young up until that point, and he realized that if he didn't stop, if he didn't make a different decision of the trajectory of his life, he was going to end up killing himself or maybe somebody else. And so he made a change. I don't know exactly what that entailed or, or what it looked like, but he became a completely different person. He ended up getting together with the woman that would become his wife, and who was somebody that he actually went to school all the way from kindergarten through high school, and they didn't really interact much with each other. And she's also one of the nicest people that I ever met when I was in school, one of the first people I met in junior high. And when I found out she was married to him, I was like, really? But, but that's how much this guy changed. They've been married for over 20 years. They've got three boys, the oldest of which is in high school right now. And the groom is telling me this because he wants me to know for sure Kevin is not the same person that he used to be, which I kind of already figured. But it, it made me think, okay, 
what if I hadn't told them over the phone? What if I hadn't said to them over the phone that I knew who Kevin was? He might have still held the meltdown, but he might not have had the meltdown until the day of the wedding when he saw me for the first time in almost 30 years. And I'm walking back to the DJ booth to cue up the music to play for their grand entrance, and the Holy Spirit speaks to me very clearly in that moment. And he says, do you get it now? It's not about you. I want to read you the scripture from 2 Corinthians. Paul's writing to the church at Corinth. He says, so that I would not become too proud of the wonderful things that were shown to me. A painful physical problem was given to me. This problem was a messenger sent from Satan, sent to beat me up and keep me from becoming too proud. I begged the Lord three times to take this problem away from me. But he said, my grace is enough for you. When you are weak, my power is made perfect in you. Verse 10, for this reason, I am happy when I have weaknesses, insults, hard times, sufferings, and all kinds of trouble for Christ. Because when I am weak, then I am truly strong. There's a weakness that we all have. All of us have a weakness. Mine, probably one of my greatest ones. Because I love being in front of the people. I love being the center of of attention. I, I love being the life of the party. And This is probably my greatest weakness, but it's something that we all have in common. We wake up with it every single day. We work with it every single day. This is our ego. Now, by ego, I'm not talking about pride in ourselves. I'm not talking about how great we think we are. And I love me. I'll just be honest with you. But I'm talking about our perspective. I'm talking about the lenses through which we view life. Everything that ever happens to us in our life is wrapped up in our ego. All our triumphs, all our tragedies, our traumas, everything that somebody's ever said about us that we took to heart, whether it was good or bad, everything that happens to us in our life makes up our ego. And while it's true that we can only possess what we experience, if we walk in our ego too much and we walk only in our ego and we only do life according to what we have captured, we end up ignoring or flat out forgetting about the other people in our lives. We forget to see things from their perspective. And this is really hard for me. It's it's, it's hard for me, and it's something I have to do every single day. And it's probably hard for you too. And you might not realize how difficult it can be from time to time. And maybe you're past this, I don't know. But I, I, I never personally never felt more humbled in my life than when Jesus had to remind me he died for someone I used to see as an enemy. This message isn't about forgiveness. This message is about humility. If it's Jesus that people need to see, then it can't be about me. If it's Jesus they need to see, then it can't be about me. I want you to read you the scripture from James 4. Real short, real sweet, real simple. Humble yourselves in the Lord's presence and he will honor you. You know, when the Pharisees were, were trying to trap Jesus and they were asking him, hey, what's the greatest commandment of all? And Jesus said, well, I got this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind. And the second commandment is just like it, love your neighbor the way you love yourself. In fact, Jesus put a button on it. And you can check this out, Matthew 22, verse 60. He said, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, everything that you have, love your neighbor as yourself. These two things are our standard. They should be the filter through which we handle every interaction that we have with anybody, anywhere, anytime. That's a high call. That's a high call. And what did I do? I took my eyes off the second commandment. I was worried about how I would feel. I was worried about how 30 years worth of hurt and pain were wrapped up in this moment. And I, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm anxious about what am I going to do when I see him again? I took my eyes off the second commandment. Now, many of you might say, well, you took the high road. You, you acted with professionalism. Well, yeah, true. But the high road is man-made. The high road is not God's highest calling. I, in some case, on the phone with the client, I did kind of drop my guard a little bit, realizing he's a different guy, but 
I could have done more. You know, I could have gotten his contact information and called Kevin earlier in the week before the wedding to say, hey, you know, I forgive you for this. There's, there's no hard feelings anymore. I don't harbor any ill will towards you anymore. And the truth is, I really didn't. I just, I didn't know how to bridge that gap, and I couldn't do it. And it's, it, 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 you know, sometimes you beat yourself up over the things that you didn't do that you could have done. This is one of those things for me. And I want to repeat this. If it's Jesus they need to see, then it can't be about me. In fact, I want you to repeat it after me, okay? If it's Jesus they need to see, then it can't be about me. All right, now I want you to say it like you actually mean it this time. If it's Jesus they need to see, then it can't be about me. Why is this important? When we're talking about living a life on fire, when we're talking about living a life on fire for Christ, walking in the Holy Spirit, why is humility such an important thing? It's so that we don't light the wrong fire. One of the scriptures that, that Pastor Darren has used as the basis for this series, 2 Timothy chapter 1, in verse 6, and I'm reading out of the New Century Version, it says, this is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you. Stir up the embers and fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you. Paul didn't say, light a fire. He said, light specifically the spiritual gift God gave you. See, we can light the wrong fire if we're not careful. If we're walking in our ego, we can light the wrong fire. This, this is you. This bowl, this is you. These matches, these are the things that make up your ego. These are the things that happen to you day in, day out. All the stuff that you've liked about yourself, all the stuff that you've disliked about yourself. I want to take you into the Wayback Machine one more time. It's October 1994, and I'm walking across Missouri State University campus where I was going to college at the time. And outside of one of the residence halls, there's a preacher standing on a stone bench preaching to a group of students, about 12, 15 students. And he's, he's more preaching at them than to them. And he's railing on about how evil the things are that they do, that college students typically do at a state university. You know, it's, it's, it's evil to drink to excess. It's evil to do drugs. It's evil to, evil to attend these, these parties where all these wild hedonistic things are happening. It's evil to, to have sex before you're married, you know, to wear makeup and revealing clothing. Those two were for the dudes. And it's, it's you know, he's going on and on about how evil these things are. But the one thing that he's not doing, and I'm watching him for a few minutes, the one thing he's not doing is saying how to get past that. He's not connecting it to God. He's just saying that the Bible says this is evil and you're evil if you do them. And I'm like, well, I, there's something not right about that. And I'm waiting for the punchline. You know, I'm waiting for him to, to get past his own personal prejudices and, and the way he's dressed. This guy's the antithesis of cool, by the way. I mean, he's, he's an older gentleman, and why when I say older, I realize I'm in my mid-40s. He's older than I am right now. He's got his hair, like, plastered to one side in the worst possible comb over, wearing big chunk glasses with thick frames. He's, I hate to say this, he's dressed like a um, denominational guy, like a really old-school denominational guy. I'm not going to say which denomination, just in case you came from that church. Um, <laughs> But he's not making any effort to connect with these kids. He's not making a single effort to connect with these kids. He's just telling them what they've heard all their lives from other Christians, how unholy they're being. And he gets off the stone bench and he starts having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a guy over to his left, over to my left. And they're talking, but the entire time that he had been preaching, all these students were like throwing it back at him. They weren't having none of it. They were they were mocking him. They were laughing at him. They were arguing with him. One guy, every about two or three minutes, praise to Buddha, just a, which was funny because he didn't look like a Buddhist at all. And, and it's, just, it's just going on. And as he leaves the bench, these guys are still talking amongst themselves and still laughing at the preacher. And frankly, as a Christian myself, I kind of didn't blame him because I was just like, why didn't this guy tell him? And then after about a minute, I hear over here in this argument, the preacher saying to the guy that he's having the conversation with, well, then you can go to hell. When we light the wrong fire, we are lighting up all of our preferences, all of our ego. It makes a big spectacle. 
it creates a flame. It creates like this little bitty show that goes on, and it, and it draws a crowd, you know? Here's the problem. We're lighting up ourselves. It stays in here. It doesn't really go any farther than right here. When people see us lighting our ego up, they only remember us. And I'm like, okay. So when I heard him yell, well, then you can go to hell. The Holy Spirit said, you know that's not right. And before I knew it, I'm standing up on that stone bench, and I said, everybody stop! And everybody stopped. The students in front of me stopped. The preacher stopped. The shuttle bus stopped. The clock in the quad stopped. <laughs> and they were like, and I said, do you guys know that God loves you? That God loves you? That he wants to have a relationship with you? That he died? He sent his son to die for your sins so that when you accepted him as your savior, you'd be washed free of all the stuff that he's talking about. Look, everything he says is, is true, except what he's not telling you is that you can come to God when you're high as a kite, when you're drunk off your butt. In, in the middle of your sin, in the middle of the evil that you're doing, you can still come to God and God will still accept you. And when you accept him and you get to know him, because he wants to know you too, and he wants you to know him and he wants you to know his love, you begin to change from the inside out. It doesn't happen on the outside first. If, you, where it's, if all you have is tight clothing, that's fine. If you need makeup, dab it on. Please. That's my opinion. Anyway, I'm telling these guys this. I'm, t- I'm telling them this. And here's the funny thing. All these students are looking at me like I'm the first person in existence that ever told them that water was a thing. Like... Th- like, they've never heard this before. In fact, that's what some of them said. Dude, thank you so much for saying this. No one's ever told us this before. No one's ever told you this. You're my age. I'm 18. You're probably 18, 19, 20. That means in all that time, no pastor, no preacher, no teacher, no parent, none of your Christian friends have said anything about it. Because they had all been, up to that point, lighting the wrong fire. See, a lot of people see Christians as people who love to let other people know how wrong they are. Here's the problem. When we light the the wrong fire, it points to ourselves. When we light the long fire... There we go. When we light the long fire, it points to Jesus. This fire is going to burn out pretty quickly because the only thing it's being fueled by is ego. This fire is going to give light to an entire room, to an entire space, even if it's the only flame that's burning. It's going to burn for a long time. And when you stir up the spiritual gift that God gave you and you light the fire that lets other people see Jesus, they're going to remember that for years. Don't light the wrong fire. When you light the wrong fire, it shows people your ego. When you light the long fire, it shows people Jesus. How do we go about doing this, though? How do we go about walking in humility? We got to consider the other people around us first. We got to consider the other people around us first. We have to offer the honor and the respect to them that we want to receive from them. When you have a conversation with somebody and they ask you, What does God say about this? Or what does the Bible say about this? One of the things I had to start telling myself to start doing, ask them why they're asking me the question. Because there's got to be a reason. They're coming from a particular perspective, and I want to know what their perspective is, because once I take the time to consider them, then they'll listen to me, and they'll be more apt to receive from me whatever God is wanting to communicate to them. We, We can't ignore God's heart for people. Because God put us in their lives. In fact, there's a quote from Madeleine LaEngle. I want to read this to you. She was the the author of A A Wrinkle in Time. It says, We draw people to Christ not by loudly discrediting what they believe, by telling them how wrong they are and how right we are, but by showing them a light that is so lovely that they want with all their hearts to know the source of it. If it's Jesus they need to see, then it can't be about me. Repeat it after me. If it's Jesus they need to see... 
then it can't be about me. You guys online, watch it online. Put that in the comments, all right? Post that, tweet that, hashtag it. Put it everywhere that you can. So how do we go about doing this? How are some practical ways that we can do this? You got a neighbor that um, is really annoying <laughs> to you? Maybe their kids are always, you know, running through the yard messing up your begonias, or maybe their, their pets are dropping landmines in your in your front yard, or maybe they, you know, maybe they don't like you because you play your music too loud in the garage or something like that. Take some baked goods over, maybe some barbecued meat, your own, and don't steal it from another neighbor, and just take it over and just maybe some, spend about 30 minutes with them, talk with them, have a cup of coffee, get to know who they are, consider them. You've got uh, a coworker that you don't get along with real well, someone you don't like all that much, take them to lunch. Spend about an hour just having a conversation with them. Find out what it is that God's doing in their lives, what he's trying to do in their lives. Maybe take them to dinner after after you get off work or something like that and and deliberately spend time with them. Do you have a child in your family, a son, a daughter, a grandchild that is always getting bad grades, they're always at odds with their parents, they're always getting in trouble? Here's an idea. Carve out a day of your schedule. Find out what it is that they love to do more than anything else in the world and take that day and go take them to do that thing and do it with them. Don't just drop them off somewhere and say, see you in eight hours. I mean, engage with them for the entire time. You'd be amazed what happens when you observe what somebody else is doing that is like the core of who they are. And oftentimes, the family is the best place for you to start acting in humility because who do we take for granted more than the people in our own family? You know what I'm saying? You guys experienced that before? Okay, a couple of you. That's awesome. More of you probably have. You can totally respond to me, by the way. It's fine. Here's the deal. Because we take these people for granted, a lot of times we end up criticizing the thing that we don't like the most about what they do. But many times the thing that we criticize the most is the stuff that they actually get the jazzed about most in life. And here's the deal. God wired them that way. My wife and I are very different people. I wish that I could have some of the primary traits that she's got because she's extremely loving. She's very thoughtful. She's one of the sweetest people in the world I know, and I'm glad I married her. But I also wish I had more of what she's got. Okay? And sometimes the things that we both love about our own selves, we clash over. You know? And and this happens in every family. It happens in every family, which is why it's the perfect place to practice this. I want to read you this scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You saw it earlier. A lot of people refer to this as the love scripture, and that's because it's read a lot at weddings. And when it's read a lot at weddings, most of the time it's taken out of context because it's not a romantic scripture. It talks about the love that we ought to have for people who don't know Jesus. It says this, chapter 13, verse 4, love is patient, love is kind, and not jealous. Love does not brag, and is not arrogant. I'm going to get Dr. Seuss on you for a minute. Love is not arrogant on a plane. Love is not arrogant on a train. Love is not arrogant face to face. Love is not arrogant over the phone. Love is not arrogant in your text messages. Love is not arrogant on social media. In fact, I want to show you a graphic, a picture of a meme I posted on social media last week that I think reflects this really well. I saw that, and I had to share it on my page because I'm like, yeah, yeah, Lord, that's me. I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't know if you've been paying attention over the last week, but we had an election last week, and um, for about the two or three months before that, Facebook was a dumpster fire. There are people that I don't follow anymore who are Christians because they were very nasty on Facebook, and I'm not pointing fingers. Because here's the deal. I've been that way too before. I have. And this is something i got to work on. I type out comments and delete them more than I put them up. And here's the thing. I want to get to the point where I don't even type the thing that I have to delete. I don't even want to get to that point. And, and this is something that we all need to practice, especially if you're active on social media. Oh, avoid it. When you're acting in your ego, when you're acting in your ego, and, and, and you say something... You know, are you doing it because you love the other person or are you doing it because you want to prove a point? 
Guys, this is hard. Humility is hard. Humility is next level faith. This is next level. This is not easy. You cannot coast through life in humility because humility is a daily decision that you have to make. I'm old school using paper. I want to read you a couple of scriptures before we wrap this up. Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What does it say? Be, be what? I can't hear you. Be what? Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. That means if I want to make a difference in somebody else's life, who has to change? I do. You have to change. If, if, you want to, if you want to see a change in somebody else's life, you have to change. Jesus said this is an upside down kingdom, but come on. I got to change? I got to change the way? Yep. Yeah. I have to change the way. If I want to get results I haven't gotten before, I got to do something different. I got to change. Walking in humility is especially hard when you feel like you don't have to. When you've been hurt, when you've been wronged, when someone has come against you and you didn't do anything to provoke it, walking in humility is really, really hard. But Proverbs says, chapter 3, verse 34, God mocks the mockers, but he gives grace to the humble. A paraphrase that happens in James says, God opposes the proud. So if I walk in my ego and I refuse to be humble, God does this to me. He literally opposes me. He stands against me. I don't like this visual. But he says, if I walk in humility, if I humble myself, what, do, what did we say, what have we been saying in this entire series that when you act in faith, when you do what the word of God says to do, there's a benefit that comes along with it. When I humble myself, God gives me grace. I didn't deserve the grace that God gave me with this Kevin situation. You know, I, I didn't. But God saw that I was willing to drop the pain. When I was on the phone with the clients, he said I was able to, to drop the pain a little bit. Oh, okay, he's, he's a different guy. He's got to be a different guy. They love him. They think the world of them. I'm going to trust that. I'm going to let go of my hurts. And you know what? God gave me grace in that moment, and he opened a door for me to, to encourage a man I otherwise would never have done that for. And it's November 8th, 2020. And today, Tony, Kevin and I are friends on Facebook. Because I decided if I'm going to walk this out, i got to walk this out. And I'm going to be completely honest and transparent with you guys. The reason I changed his name to Kevin is because he doesn't know I'm saying any of this to you today. And I didn't want to embarrass him. And the reason he doesn't know that is because I never reached out to him. I never contacted him, sent him a message on Facebook or called him up and said, hey, by the way, we're cool. And I think there's a part of me that's scared to because I don't want to make him feel guilty for what he did to me. But if I bring it up, I'm, I'm afraid that those feelings might trigger in him. And the truth of the matter is I'm not done with this yet. I'm still in the middle of this. And that's why I felt it was important to share this with you guys today because you're probably in the middle of something with somebody else in your life. In fact, I want you to close your eyes for a moment. You guys online, everybody in the house, I want you to close your eyes. I want you to think about somebody in your life that you need to consider that you haven't been. It could be a family member. It could be somebody that you work with. You know, it might be, it might be like me and it might be somebody that hurt you a long time ago. Maybe it's a friend you just haven't spoken to in years. I want you to consider them and I want you to take a look at them not through your ego, not through your eyes, but think about what they might be going through. Think about what they might have had to deal with. And now, with your eyes still closed, I want you to look at them 
through God's eyes. I want you to see the child that he created. The person that he loves, that he cares for, that he has great plans for. I want you to feel the Holy Spirit speaking to you right now, reminding you, you know, Jesus died for that person just like he died for you. Recognize that without the grace of God acting in your life, you might be where they are right now. Open your eyes. If it's Jesus they need to see, then it can't be about me. Heavenly Father, we come before you today with hearts open. God, we're ready to do what it is that you want us to do. We want to take this opportunity, Lord, and not waste it. God, your word says that when we humble ourselves, when we light the long fire and we don't light the wrong fire, you're going to give us grace. You're going to give us an opportunity to do something that we know we should do. Lord, I pray that we take the opportunity. I pray that we don't waste this time. I pray that we don't squander this moment whether it's a phone call, a message, a knock on the door, whatever it is, Lord God, give us grace to make sure we don't miss this. We ask for your blessings on this. We ask you to bless those people in our lives that we are considering. And we thank you for your graciousness in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.